the court ruling uh, will be a good with reference for the other companies, like uh, manufacturing companies like SK Hynix or some others to prepare, you know, their counterattack, the counterattack measures to respond with similar uh, cases. That story is coming up later in our program. You're listening to Asia News Weekly, a digest of some of the biggest stories from the Asia Pacific region. Seoul Tokyo Relations. Natural disasters wreak havoc in Japan and South Korea and the pursuit of democracy in Asia. These stories and more are on the August 29th edition of Asia News Weekly. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm your host, Steve Miller. Before we begin with this week's first story, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our new listeners from the Japan Today website. I hope you'll enjoy the show and, of course, contribute to our discussions. First up, a story about bilateral relations between Seoul and Tokyo. Reports surfaced last week that South Korean President Park Geun-hye encouraged Yoo hyung soo the new Korean ambassador to Japan, to play a role in moving a nuclear safety proposal involving China and Japan forward. She wished to invite the United States, Russia, North Korea, and Mongolia to join the regional initiative, noting that nuclear safety, if not properly handled, would pose a grave threat to East Asia. However, you reiterated that senior-level meetings were still contingent on Japan addressing outstanding issues related to the military's use of sex slaves and revisionist history. The two leaders must meet, but for that, Japan's sincerity should come first, you said. However, in Seoul's eye, that might not be possible anytime soon. As noted in our August 18th Asia Now, the Asahi Shimbun retracted landmark stories about Korea's comfort women. Since then, some Japanese lawmakers have called for the 1993 Kono Statement to be abandoned in full or, at the very least, a formal revision. Michael Chuchek, adjunct fellow at the Institute for Contemporary Asian Studies at Temple University, Japan, noted that the call for a new statement might be a political move by Takaichi Sane. Regardless of what the motive is, according to Chuchek, until Suga moves decisively against the PRAC's request, his inaction will be read or portrayed by South Koreans as a prelude to a revision of the Kono Statement and thus one more reason to delay the re-establishment of more normal relations between the governments of Japan and the ROC. Former Japanese Prime Minister Tomiichi Murayama, who formally apologized to Korea for Japan's colonial rule and aggression, calling it an unquestionable historical fact in 1995, called upon Abe to follow through on his promise to uphold previous apologies, which he said serve as the foundations for better Seoul Tokyo ties. However, in an editorial by the Yomi Uri Shimbun, the paper called for a new statement saying, there has been a misunderstanding, spread widely through the international community, that a large number of women were forcibly taken away by the Japanese Imperial Army to serve as sex slaves, the Kono Statement is a factor in that misunderstanding. The paper mentioned that a new government statement on the issue would be significant for passing down correct history both at home and abroad, with next year seeing the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II and the 50th anniversary of the normalization of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Nonetheless, it is also a fact that the honor and dignity of a large number of women were hurt during the war, even though there was no forcible taking away of comfort women. Also compounding the issue is Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's April letter to the Koyasan Okinawan Temple in western Japan, where over 1,000 alleged and convicted World War II era war criminals are being honored. Abe wrote in his letter, I humbly express my deepest sympathy for the martyrs, who sacrificed their souls to become the foundation of peace and prosperity in Japan today. I hope for eternal peace and pledge to work towards harmonious coexistence of mankind in the future. Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga said Abe's letter was sent in his capacity as head of Japan's ruling party, not as prime minister. Both China and South Korea condemned the Prime Minister's actions, with South Korea saying it was worse than going to the Yasukuni Shrine. The diplomat Zachary Keck reiterated an idea I proposed in March of 2013. If South Korea, and of course China, 
want Japan to reflect on history so that relations can improve, then they need to spell it out in concrete terms with actionable items. Continuing to use terms like taking a sincere attitude to face up to its history just won't do. Even in the United States, the Heritage Foundation is criticizing South Korea and Japan for not moving past their differences and creating possible issues with two of the United States military allies. But the issues go beyond diplomats. When I shared a story of an alleged map made by the Japanese government that recognizes South Korea's ownership of Dokdo, called Takashima in Japan, an immediate and heated debate ensued in the comments from readers. To be fair, it is time that Japan take a long, hard, and unpleasant look into its past and acknowledge wrongdoings. The issue of the comfort woman goes beyond the issue of forcibly recruiting young women and is about a systemic culture that subjugated and violated their human rights. It's something that doesn't seem to get through to those defending the system. That being said, the same must be also true for South Korea. Seoul needs to admit it also ran a human trafficking system much like the Japanese, which were mentioned in our July 11th episode. Korea also needs to admit hundreds of thousands of civilians and political prisoners were slaughtered after liberation. The late Korean president, Ro Mu Hyun, created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2005 despite heavy opposition from conservative groups and politicians. The commission did give official recognition, concluding the deaths were unlawful. However, as Bruce Cummings, professor of history at the University of Chicago said, Little has happened since the commission disbanded, except that Presidents E. M. Pak and their supporters pretend that none of this happened. Not the investigation, and not the massacres. Hello, pot calling kettle. As relations between Japan and Korea continue to stagnate, what do you think is needed for Seoul and Tokyo to mend the fence? Or do you think that is even possible with the sitting heads of states? Please leave your thoughts in the comments on Facebook or Twitter. In just a few minutes, updates on elections and changes in power in Southeast Asia. Last week, torrential rains triggered a deadly landslide in Japan's Hiroshima prefecture. As rescuers combed through the resulting debris, the grim task of recovering victims ensued. Nearly 40 were retrieved in the initial days, and it's expected that the final death toll could easily raise to more than 80. The landslide occurred in a residential area and caused several houses to collapse. Because of heavy rains over the previous weekend, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe delayed an aerial inspection of the city. Some media outlets said Abe feared it would further complicate the search and rescue mission. He did arrive on Monday to personally inspect the disaster scene and pledge government support. 3,000 rescuers are on scene, including ground troops, firefighters, and police. Their operation was suspended for seven hours on Sunday morning as rain renewed concerns about more landslides, said public broadcaster NHK. Before the landslide, several residents reported strange smells, sounds, and tremors. There was a smell like earth mixed with sulfur, recalled a 68-year-old woman who said rocks and earth flowed into the ground floor of her home. A 70-year-old man who had muddy water flow under the floor of his house said, There were strong smells of earth, green wood, and grass. This is not normal, I thought. Then I heard boom, boom the sound of rocks rolling. Takashi Chuchida, a professor of geotechnics at Hiroshima University and a member of an emergency team surveying the disaster area said, the area where the collapse started isn't hollowed out much. It was probably a surface failure in which there was a flow of earth and rocks near the surface. Taking all of this into consideration, it's important that there are three types of sediment disasters, landslides, cliff collapses, and debris flows. Each have their own specific set of indicators. What's being reported in Hiroshima is very characteristic and has more in common with debris flows rather than proper landslides. Nevertheless, both can be deadly. Unfortunately, events like these aren't all that uncommon in Japan or other Asian regions during this time of year. In fact, in 1999, a similar deadly tragedy hit Hiroshima. In 2001, Japan enacted a new law asking prefectures to investigate and designate areas prone to landslides as hazard zones. 
However, in this particular case, only one of the areas struck by the recent mudslides was designated as a hazard zone. According to sources, fewer than 40% of the areas in Hiroshima are considered to have a high chance of landslides. One possible reason for this, at least according to one unnamed official, is the likely impact on property values, which is really easy to see given the effect of placing a home in a flood zone has on its value in the United States. While the jobs of politicians are complex, and they most certainly do want to preserve real estate values, if the omission of hazard zones was purposeful to preserve property values, the aversion to safety could amount to negligence, and those responsible need to be held accountable. Crossing the sea and switching to South Korea, heavy rains battered Busan and Cheongwon in the nation's southeastern region. In just three or four hours, 200 millimeters, or about 7.8 inches of rain fell. It completely caught the cities off guard. In fact, the images posted by news agencies online showed stores on the ground level halfway submerged. Subway entrances were transformed into scenes reminiscent out of something from the Poseidon adventure, and buses were overturned and whisked away like toy cars. In fact, Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Company was forced to halt operations at its Cori No. 2 nuclear reactor after rain seeped into a water intake facility, said spokeswoman Trey Shiye. Sadly, according to reports, at least five are dead and four are missing. Links to all of these stories will be made available at asianewsweekly.net. And while you're there, be sure to leave a comment and follow us on Facebook and Twitter so you can receive even more news updates throughout the week. This year, we've seen a pair of big changes in Southeast Asian governments. In Indonesia, Joko Widodo edged out Prabowo Subianto with a little over 53% of the vote. Prabowo, however, refused to concede and took his challenge to the court, alleging widespread election fraud. Last week, the issue was finally put to bed when Constitutional Court Chairman Hamdan Zoelva announced the court had rejected that challenge. Leading up to the announcement, Protesters gathered, and anticipating possible violence, the government deployed police in riot gear. The BBC's Karishma Vaswani was on scene and said protesters breached barbed wire barricades, prompting police to fire tear gas and water cannons to disperse the crowd. While the decision does solidify Widodo's position as president-elect, and the Proboo team did acknowledge the ruling, they said they would not accept it. They hinted Prabowo might pursue alternative legal avenues, including taking the case to Indonesia's Supreme Court or take the matter up in Parliament. But previous legal challenges in both 2004 and 2009 were both unsuccessful. If Prabowo does move forward with his challenges, it appears his running mate, who has been absent from recent engagements, won't be joining him. If the election was truly fraudulent, then keeping up the good fight is the right thing to do. However, after a scandal hit the Constitutional Court this past summer, the entity appears to be doing everything it can to remain above board, and perhaps it is finally time for Prabowo to accept defeat and move on to allow the nation to come together. Power transfers don't always go smoothly, but since staging a bloodless coup in Thailand, General Prayu Chanocha has managed to keep things relatively calm. This week, he was officially named the new Prime Minister of the Nation, and the only candidate up for that job. The move isn't without its criticisms, some even comparing the junta rule to North Korea's one-party system. This time, coup makers have learned from 2006, said Dr. Titinan Pongsudarak, director of the Institute of Security and International Studies at Chulalongkorn University. The doctor continued, They see that the 2000 coup was a half-baked coup. They lost control. So this time, they want to concentrate power among themselves. They want to maintain control, all through to election, and perhaps beyond. General Preyut is scheduled to retire from the army next month, and that change could give him more credibility as a civilian leader. Duong Jun Pot Ingamon, a street vendor, had this to say. Even though he is from the military, the fact that he is a soldier has allowed the situation in Thailand to calm down and become peaceful once again. I think this is good. There is no point saying whether a coup is good or whether it is bad. 
I have never said that all my actions are correct or incorrect. I take responsibility for my actions, and others must take responsibility for theirs. The National Council for Peace and Order has also informed the public that martial law will remain in effect. There may be one obstacle for General Preyut. Sri Suwan Janya has launched a legal challenge, claiming the National Legislative Assembly's choice of Preyut is unconstitutional due to a conflict of interest and has called for the general to step down as the head of the NCPO. But now that Preyut has received the king's blessing and is the official prime minister of Thailand, other nations also need to move on. However, the concerns do remain. What kind of leader will Preyut be? What are your thoughts? Will Thailand return to a true democracy, or will the nation remain under the thumb of the military? Be sure to share your thoughts. I look forward to hearing them. In just a moment, does Japan have a gambling problem? When we think about South Korean technology, one of the very first names that comes to mind is Samsung. Three years ago, production line employees filed a suit against the company, alleging working conditions contributed to them developing leukemia and ultimately their death. The Protector of Health and Human Rights of Semiconductor Workers has claimed that up to 70 workers have died of leukemia and other illnesses after working at the electronics firm. In 2011, the Seoul Administrative Court ruled in favor of the families of two employees who died of acute leukemia after working on Samsung semiconductor production lines. That court decision marked the very first official acknowledgement of a link between leukemia deaths and exposure to cancer-causing substances at the plants operated by the firm. The decision was then appealed to the Seoul High Court. Joining me now from the Korea Times is Kim Yu Chol with their decision. I think this is very meaningful because the yeah, Samsung factory workers and some of them are suffering from leukemia and incurable diseases. But the government in past years very hard to admit those illnesses as occupational illnesses. But a recent local court said the government should compensate for some workers at Samsung factory who are suffering from you know, leukemia or something like cancer-stricken or things. The court ruling uh, will be a good reference for the other companies, like uh, manufacturing companies like SK Heinrich or some others, to prepare you know, their counter-attack, the counter-attack measures to respond with similar like, cases. That again was Kim Yu Chol from the Korea Times. Crossing the sea to Japan, TEPCO has now been ordered to pay the family of a woman who killed herself after the Fukushima disaster 49 million yen, which comes to about 472,000 U.S. dollars. Three months after the plant's failure, Mrs. Watanabe and her husband were forced to evacuate their home because of radioactive contamination. Distraught, she doused herself in kerosene and self-immolated. Her husband and children then sued TEPCO for 91 million yen, claiming the evacuation from her home is what led to her decreased mental state. This is the second payout by TEPCO on suicide-related issues. However, I do have a problem with this particular court mandate. Yes, TEPCO's failure to adequately safeguard the area forced the evacuation of Mrs. Watanabe. However, suicide is a personal choice. If Watanabe made no attempts to seek out help for her depressed state of mind, then can TEPCO really be held fully responsible? Yes, hold TEPCO responsible for the disaster, order them to pay for counseling, other medical ailments, and even damages. But if someone doesn't make attempts to seek out treatment for depression, then who is responsible for that? Please share your thoughts on these stories. Do you think these rulings are just, and do they go far enough? Please leave your thoughts in the comments, and I can't wait to hear them. Don't miss our other podcast, Asia Now. It's released every Wednesday and features stories and interviews from the Asia-Pacific region. This week, how the Pope's visit affected South Korea, and an American searches for giant sequoias in Seoul. Susumu Higuchi, Japan's leading expert on addiction, recently completed a study sponsored by the health ministry. 
He found that nearly 5% of Japanese adults are addicted to gambling, five times that of many other nations, and unfortunately, rates of addiction are increasing. The study was conducted because the Japanese government is contemplating legalizing casino gambling in certain special economic zones, hoping it will boost the number of foreign tourists. Gambling itself is rampant in Japan, with pachinko parlors, betting on sports, and lotteries all being legal. Quote, there is an absolute lack of preventative education for gambling addiction, said Noriko Tanaka head of the society concerned about gambling addiction. She continued to say that Japan hasn't allocated sufficient resources to address the issue and has called for open discussions on the negative economic and social impacts of gambling. But should there be widespread concern over gambling? Or is the economic gain worth it? Well, let's take a look at another country and compare. Since I'm an American, we'll use the United States. Bernard P. Horn wrote, For years, Lawmakers forgot why gambling was considered a vice. In fairness to them, there weren't a lot of objective studies available on the consequences of legalized gambling. The many new gambling outlets sparked opportunities for social and economic research. By 1994, a considerable body of evidence showed that the expansion of legalized gambling destroys individuals, wrecks families, increases crime, and ultimately costs society far more than the government makes. So let's break it down. In the United States in 1976, 0.77% of Americans were addicted to gambling. That's right, less than 1%. By 1994, that number rose to between 5 and 7% in most areas as Indian casinos opened. As of 2010, that number has also remained fairly consistent. So currently, Japan and the United States have the same percentage of populations being addicted to gambling. Given the amount of gambling in Japan, it's unknown how the addition of casinos would affect the Japanese numbers. And that's what should be studied. It probably will go up, but the question is how much and what impact that will have on society. South Korea could provide an answer as it saw a significant increase in addictive behavior as gambling was expanded. Another item that bears watching that was uncovered in the United States study, in some areas where gambling was introduced, there was a 69% increase in spousal abuse, and the study also showed that 37% of pathological gamblers also abuse their children. If Japan chooses to try and lure tourists with casinos leading up to the 2020 Olympics, it needs to do so carefully taking everything into consideration. Moving on to the Asian news update. First up, now that Japan's government has reinterpreted its use of collective self-defense, the nation is now contemplating building its own fighter jets. A previous attempt faced opposition from the United States, who then partnered with Japan to build the F-2 fighter. It's an aging aircraft set to be retired in about 14 years. Estimates for the purely domestic fighter place the development cost at around 500 to 800 billion yen, which is about 4.8 to 7.7 .7 billion US dollars. And this could be a huge boon to companies like IHI, Mitsubishi Heavy, and other defense contractors. From Taiwan, the ex-deputy of Mainland Affairs Council's Chang Shen Hao has rejected accusations he was spying for China. He resigned from his position and has been under investigation for leaking confidential information. Chang admits no wrongdoing and says he was following the instructions of those above him, saying, There are many open or private channels of negotiation or communication between the two sides. I was only one of the pawns who followed instructions he announced at a press conference. Taiwan's investigation bureau had planned to refer Chang's case to the High Court Prosecutor's Office on a treason-related charge of betraying a government-entrusted duty of conducting business with a foreign government, which does carry a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. However, since Beijing isn't really considered a foreign government, that move didn't go through. It's unclear what the fallout will be should the allegations be confirmed, but there is a growing level of mistrust between the mainland and Taiwan, and that could hamper further relations. 
In South Korea, foreign car sales are up, but at the top of the heap are BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, and Audi. Trying to get a larger percentage of sales in South Korea, Toyota is introducing a new hybrid Prius taxi. It will sell for about $5,000 US dollars less than the consumer model, but still more expensive than the newest Hyundai Sonata taxi. Toyota feels that because the Prius more than doubles the projected fuel efficiency rating of the Sonata, it could snag a huge chunk of the taxi market. However, I'm not too sure Korean companies will be so quick to purchase Japanese cars. The cost of lost customers may be more than the fuel that they could possibly save. I suspect that Kia or Hyundai will also shortly enter a hybrid model of their own. Turning to close encounters, a Chinese fighter jet got up close and personal with a U.S. patrol craft. How close? According to reports, some 20 to 30 feet. That's less than 10 meters. Quote, We have registered our strong concerns to the Chinese about the unsafe and unprofessional intercept, which posed a risk to the safety and well-being of the air crew and was inconsistent with customary international law, said Rear Admiral John Kirby. According to Kirby, the Chinese jet passed the nose of the P-8 at 90 degrees with its belly toward the P-8 Poseidon. The U.S. believes the Chinese aircraft was making a point of showing its weapons load, and then the Chinese aircraft flew directly under and alongside the P-8, bringing their wingtips, as I said, within 20 feet, and then conducted a roll. This event took place on August 19th. Kirby then continued, Also, it undermines, and we've made this clear, that it undermines efforts to continue developing military-to-military -military relations with the Chinese military. Kirby called the situation very, very dangerous. If you recall, Chinese aircraft have also buzzed Japanese planes in the ADIZ, and China again dismissed this event, saying the Chinese pilot maintained a safe distance. Then again, on Wednesday of this week, China flew four separate sorties into Taiwan's ADIZ, further pushing its claim on the region. Unfortunately, we're getting closer and closer to a point where something could terribly go wrong. China reportedly executed eight from the volatile Xinjiang region. Those executed were convicted on terrorist charges, and three were of said to have been involved with the deadly bombing last year in Tiananmen Square. The official Xinhua news agency said the group's crimes included manufacturing explosives, murder of government officials, and an establishment of a terrorist organization. All of the men were Muslim Uyghurs. And finally, it didn't happen on Liberation Day, but it may be coming soon. The U.S. Korea Institute at John Hopkins University says North Korea's Sohei Satellite Launching Station might be open for business before the end of the year, according to new satellite images. The facility has been under construction and expansion since the middle of 2013, and when fully operational, it would allow the DPRK to launch an ICBM. Such a move would greatly elevate tension in the region and force the other members of the six-party talks to craft a meaningful and definitive response, to which they haven't thus far. Well, my friends, those are all the stories for this week's episode. But before we close out the show, let's take a quick look and hear what you had to say in the comments from some of our recent shows. First up is F.V. Goch, who explains why it is hard for Korea and Japan to get along. Every time Korea tries to forget and reconcile with Japan, they found Japan sneering. The mistrust is not due to the past they are holding on to, but the attitude of Japan as a whole. Japan is not willing to develop solid relationship with Korea or China. Korea has gone through the past 1,000 years defending against countless attacks, big or small, from Japan, and the Koreans know there could never be peace between the two. Westerners could not understand this from a third-person perspective, especially when it is not their ancestors who have lost their lives fighting off Japan's atrocities. Asking the two to get along is like asking a serial rapist to peacefully coexist with a 16-year-old girl under the same roof. Zio Kim commented on our story on gay marriage in Taipei. Thanks for publishing. I really appreciate it. For crying out loud, being a member of the LGBT is not a matter of choice. I honestly cannot believe how on earth that is possible. Is there any conceivable example 
that heterosexual people decided or choose to be homosexual. As one who has been spat on, exposed to violence, threatened, declared as wrongful life in public, and caged to correction, I want to say there are matters that can't be changed. And finally, many people wrote in about our bullying death story, saying that unfortunately in South Korea, bullying begins in school and extends into adulthood. It's there that things sometimes turn violent, and an abuse of power takes a deadly turn. It's also because of social media that we're learning more about these events because they can be easily shared. Thanks again for all these comments. I really do appreciate the time it takes you to write them, and I really do value them, and I hope that this week you'll continue to share your opinions on the stories in Asian News Weekly. You can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. The address for both of those is just Asian News Weekly on Facebook, the Facebook page, or at Asian News Weekly on Twitter. If you have any questions or feedback about the show, you can email us directly. Just drop a line to asiannewsweekly at gmail.com. You can play and download all of our episodes from our website, over at the Korea Times or the Japan Today websites, and of course on SoundCloud. If you prefer the show in podcast form, you'll be able to find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. And if you truly enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and subscribe so you won't miss the next one. Thanks again for listening this week. For Asia News Weekly, I'm Steve Miller, reminding you to be true to yourself and always be awesome. Asia News Weekly is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.